I think for most people, MMA fighters are pretty scary. I mean, you've dedicated your life to one-on-one -on -one combat, a concept that most people avoid at all costs. But even amongst other fighters, there are those that stand out as truly intimidating, that have had their opponents second guess whether they should have just become a sculptor like your everyday Arcadian. Sculptor, sir. But unfortunately, no one can stay at the top of their game forever, be it injuries, old age, just one too many wars, even the most terrifying of opponents will fall. These are the ones who went from the most scary to the easiest to defeat. I'm Balian from MMA On Point, and as always, before we get started, huge shout out to our Hall of Fame channel members for supporting us. What's up, guys? It's me, Balian. Guess what? What? Jocko is back with their brand new product, Jocko Milk. The all new Jocko Milk ready to drink protein shakes designed and engineered with a protein blend of milk protein, concentrate, and calcium caseinate. Oh, it's a protein blend that helps fuel muscle growth and recovery all day long. 180 calories with no added sugar, no artificial sweeteners or colors, and still tastes unbelievable. Unbelievable! It doesn't have that protein chalk taste to it. Both the chocolate and vanilla flavors, they just hit different. Make sure you use your 10% off exclusive code, MMA on point. More on that later, but for now, here are the 10 scariest fighters who became easy prey. Number 10, Tiago Alves. When most people talk about leg kicks in MMA, they'll mention the names Edson Barbosa and Jose Aldo, both Brazilians, both fantastic kickers. But if you were watching the UFC around the mid 2000s, you'll probably remember Thiago Alves. At five foot 10 and absolutely swollen to the gills like a bald Jason Momoa, Alves was physically imposing with massive shoulders and thighs that packed enough power to run a small Brazilian town. On the feet, he threw nasty knees, elbows, kicks, and punches, and could chain everything together with vicious combinations and intent. At his best, he went on a five fight strike KO TKO streak of wins in the welterweight division which made him a scary ass human and they all came before the third round and even his decisions against guys like Koscheck were complete maulins. However, after he was soundly beaten by GSP in his title attempt and again by John Fitch, the mystique started to fade. He started dropping losses to guys like Rick Story and Martin Campman. After that, he got injured multiple times and was out for nearly three years. When he did come back, things just didn't get any better and his resident evil boss-like aura just started to fade. He won just two out of his last eight fights in the UFC, losing to guys you've probably never heard of, like Alexi Concheco and Lariano Steropoli. But for a time, he was one of the scariest men to ever make 170 pounds, and he has done pretty well in BKFC, to be fair. Number nine, Tiago Santos. There aren't many people who can wield the power of four. I think it was just that Captain America bloke, and that was about it. Actually, spoilers, sorry. But there has at least been one man in MMA, the guy they called Maheta, who just so happened to get the bloody thing tattooed on his chest. Thiago had the dexterity of a guy who trained capoeira since he was eight years old, and the power of Bane on Costa's secret juice. It took him a bit of a while to get going in the UFC, but he showed that his hands weren't just hammers, so were his feet when he will kick Jack Marshman, pummeled Gerald Mearshart, folded Jack Amanson, and just overwhelmed Anthony Smith. With each fight, he got physically bigger and bigger until he jumped up to 205, where he had people running scared. One clean strike and he would have you reeling, and he won four in a row before he got a shot at John Jones, where he was the first fighter in history to actually be awarded a win against him on a judge's scorecard. But, well, he injured everything in that fight. ACL, PCL, MCL, meniscus, and a cracked tibia. I mean, I don't know what half that stuff means, but he was in pain, and sadly, well, he was never really the same again. Again. He almost finished Glover in his next fight, but then he was tapped, and then he became a much more conservative version of himself, as losses against Rakic and Kalaev and a TKO loss to Jamal Hill filled up his record. His lone win in that time was against Johnny Walker, and it was a very slow-paced fight where almost all his intimidating presence had just evaporated. And since moving to the PFL, he's lost to Rob Wilkinson. He's booked again to fight on June 8th at PFL 4, so let's see if he can turn things around. Number 8, Robbie Lawler. 20-year-old Robbie Lawler quivered the vertebrae of half the UFC roster before he was even legally able to drink. Dana brought him in as a birthday present to himself, and he went on an absolute tear, earning the nickname Ruthless Gunslinging with anyone that would stand in front of him. The UFC labelled him as a KO puncher, physically powerful, and most importantly, a product of the Militich fight camp, which meant he was training with some of the most dangerous men on the planet. There were also stories of him backstage where he would just lay about, and when asked if he was nervous, he just said, nah man, I'm just gonna go out there and beat his ass, which he did until he ran into Nick Diaz, who slept him, and then Evan Tanner sent him packing out of the UFC. But even 
and then he was knocking people out cold in Icon Sport, Pride, and then Elite XC. It wasn't until he got to Strike Force where we started to see the shadow of terror he cast get a lot shorter. He started showing up to fights looking a little out of shape, unmotivated, even then moved up a weight class and missed weight for a catch weight fight at 195 pounds. Then at press conferences and interviews, he just seemed disinterested and unmotivated. Uh, I just wasn't uh, at my best and he won, so that's all that matters. His UFC run beginning in 2013, though, was a different story. He KO'd Koscheck in the first round in a return to welterweight and a performance of the night, two, three fight win streaks later, and he was the world champion. And he blasted his way through the division, looking once again like the unstoppable Terminator. And the idea of fifth round war Lawler, it was terrifying. But after defending the belt twice, he was KO'd by Tyron Woodley in the first round, and it kind of all just went downhill from there. He lost six of his next eight fights, looking like a very gun-shy version of himself, not wanting to engage, meaning the Shroud of Terror just kind of faded away. Of course, he'd been in the sport for 20 years at this point, and almost every fighter slows down with age, but he was once the most ruthless man in the cage. Number seven, Usamar Palharis. Imagine agreeing to fight someone in MMA who just simply won't stop submitting you even when you tap. I mean, that's not a sport at that point, that's just a street fight. But if you know anything about Usamar Palharis, you'll know that he wasn't satisfied with you tapping. He just wanted to break something. That alone is a scary thought. But seeing the way he ripped people's limbs apart during his first UFC run only made him more terrifying. Before arriving in the UFC, he won the Fury FC Middleweight Grand Prix by simply destroying ankles all in the first round. Then he armbarred Ivan Salaveri in the first round and Joe Rogan was already on the broadcast talking about him fighting Anderson Silva. And then he started crushing people. Thomas Draval, who he tapped in 45 seconds, except that didn't mean much as he didn't let go of the submission and got suspended. He stacked up three more leg locks until he was kicked out of the promotion for once again not letting go of a submission. Oh, and I guess elevated testosterone, which yeah, only kind of makes him even more scary. In the World Series of Fighting, the hits kept coming. Another three first round submissions all by ripping legs apart. Oh, and I don't think their drug testing policy was working because he was even bigger and more jacked than ever. But he got the boot as well and then things went downhill. He was TKO'd by Emil Meek in Venator and then he started fighting in Poland and Russia where he lost to guys who would never have been on his level. Names I can't even pronounce. And he only won one out of his last eight fights. He was no longer the scary submission monster, more like every child's best friend, Sully. Number six, Vitor Belfort. Pretty much like Robbie Lawler, the Phenom came into the UFC as a 22-year-old hungry contender who savagely beat his first three opponents in the first round and was definitely a scary man to face in the octagon. He had a BJJ black belt and faster hands than young Leonardo DiCaprio. Did you even see me? I was so damn fast. After a stint in cage rage and affliction, he drilled Matt Lindland with a perfect left hand in 40 seconds and he came back to haunt the UFC middleweight division once more. He challenged for two belts, lost in both attempts, but then he found the secret of TRT and turned into Super Shredder and became one of the scariest men on the goddamn planet. I think most of you know about 2013 Vitor Belfort. Three fights in Brazil, three knockouts against MMA champions, and in every single one of them, he was a jacked up, adrenaline fueled monster. But before he got his title shot against Weidman, USADA banned TRT, and Vitor chose to withdraw from his scheduled bout against the champion. He wouldn't fight for nearly two years, and when he did, he looked like a devolved version of himself, and after an early flurry, was soundly beaten by the champion. After that, he only offered about two minutes of fighting in every subsequent contest, and he was finished by three straight opponents. A far stretch from the guy who'd been the boogeyman of the division. The game plan was out on how to beat him, and eventually Lyoto Machida retired him with another front kick in a fight he didn't look like he belonged in. Still outside of MMA, he's been boxing, and well, steroids are a hell of a drug. Number five, Quinton Rampage Jackson. When he found out he could get paid for whooping ass, it was a no-brainer for Rampage. He signed up to be an MMA fighter and realized what his calling was in life, picking other men up as high in the air as possible and then trying to slam them through the very earth itself. If he wasn't already scary enough, Rampage always walked out with this huge ass industrial chain around his neck like some caged animal. His brother Derek told him to wear it during high school wrestling matches after he lost five in a row and the pre-fight gimmick led him to go undefeated. That's a scary man. Match with his wolf-like howl, basically made Rampage not even seem human. Apart from one 14 second DQ loss in Pride, he won nine fights in a row and he finished all but one opponent in vicious fashion, hammering people with heavy punches, devastating slams and Kratos like ground and pound. The only guy he couldn't finish by the way was Murillo Bustamante who just happened to be the UFC champion at the time. He could have taken the belt off him. Even after Pride, he made his way to the UFC and he ended the legendary seven fight win streak of Chuck Liddell. But after losing to John Jones in an effort to retake his 205 belt, things 
things started to go downhill for Rampage. He started to have trouble making the weight, for the first time ever lost two consecutive fights in a row, and after transitioning to Bellator, he kept winning, but just not against the same level of opponent. Obviously, every fighter starts to show signs of aging, and Rampage finished out his MMA run one and three at the heavyweight division. Quinton was, though, at one point, one of the most intimidating fighters in the world. Number four, Henan Barrao. For five years, the bantamweight division of the Brazilian regional scene was cursed to be haunted by the Baron Henan Barrao. He sacked up 23 wins in a row, finishing practically everyone with submissions and TKOs before finally making his trip to North America. So to most American fans, the streaking Brazilian finisher was still practically unknown. He was off lurking in the shadows like Nosferatu. But even just looking at him, the man was pretty goddamn terrifying, okay? He had a shaved head, was massive for the weight class, and had kind of got pointy ears that just gave him this whole Lord of the Rings vibe. Then he fought Brad Pickett in Birmingham, England in the co-main event and showcased his ruthless striking and ability to jump on someone's back like a creature of the night. Then all of a sudden, Dominic Cruz was injured and he was put in against Uriah Faber to fight for the title. And everyone thought the California kid was gonna be the champ without Dom around, but I don't know, the Baron stuffed all his takedowns and outstruck him across the five rounds. Then he turned into an actual monster as the champion, easily finishing every contender that dared step in his lair. After he TKO'd Faber in the first round, he hadn't lost in 31 straight fights. Are you scared yet? But of course, TJ finished him and one of the scariest men on the roster went on one of the craziest post-championship slides in history. He lost seven of his next nine fights to the likes of Brian Kelleher, Andre Yule, Luke Sanders, guys he could have just walked through in his prime. He went from hunter to hunted and really did become easy prey for the rest of the division. Number three, Chuck Liddell. You know, before we had mixed martial arts, everyone thought the karate guys or the strikers were the baddest dudes around. I mean, have you seen how many boards they can break? Well, I fashion myself a master in this. Oh. But then all those wrestlers and jujitsu guys just showed up and started taking everyone down. And you know what? For a while, their striking wasn't shit. But the reason Chuck Liddell was so scary, well, was because he could stuff your takedowns and then absolutely beat the shit out of you on the feet. And that's what he did to 10 straight opponents in a row. Everyone who fell asleep in front of the Mohawk sporting head tattooed Kenpo Karate knockout artist. After losing in pride and coming back to the UFC, he went on a legendary seven fight knockout streak where he pummeled everybody with long rangy loopy punches and bone shattering kicks. He could also take a punch like nobody's business. And once he had the belt, defended it four times, he was basically looked at as invincible. That was until I already mentioned Rampage Jackson came along and knocked him out cold for the first time. And after that, he was never quite the same again. He would only win one more fight in the next three years with his last three appearances in the octagon all ending with him unconscious. He just couldn't take a punch like he used to and from one of the most dominant champions at the time became a victim for everyone he fought against. He made a return to the sport in 2018 to rematch Tito Ortiz one more time and was the definition of easy prey for the Huntington Beach bad boy who sadly added another KO loss to his record. Number two, Hector Lombard. If you know anything about Yoel Romero, you'll know that the Cuban athletic program is pretty brutal and what growing up inside of it is really like. They go to the schools to, to look for talent. You, the people take it when, they, the, when the kid is uh, very young, you know, and go to the special school for sport. The number one guy has the most privilege. It's good and it's bad because it pushes you to be the best. You want to get What's more the food. Bad part? You have to become a fucking machine. Hector Lombard was also born in this Cuban system, starting from age 10 and eventually winning 10 gold medals across the world and competing in the Olympics, representing Cuba in judo. In 2004, however, he made the transition to MMA where he slowly built himself into an absolute wrecking ball. He had incredible power in his hands and would flatline people if he landed clean, but also had his ridiculously effective judo-based account people into the air. Between 2007 and 2011, he won 24 fights in a row, including dominating in the cage fighting championships as a champion and winning the Bellator middleweight season. He became an absolute force of destruction and a nightmare for any 185er because if you weren't getting judo tossed, you were probably getting your brain rattled. But in his UFC debut, he shockingly lost a split decision to Tim Bosch. After he moved down to welterweight, he won three in a row, although one was overturned due to uh, steroids. What? What? No! And after he tested positive for that, he started to lose every single fight.
qualifying. Six losses in a row where he was KO'd three times, disqualified and dragged to a decision in fights where he was just gassed or looked like a shell of his former unbeatable tank of a self. His final fight was a slobber knocker with Thiago Silva at light heavyweight that ended in a no contest after Hector was dropped and hit with an illegal knee. Again, he's another fighter who's had some success in BKFC, but before his UFC debut, he was a rampaging warlord of destruction. Number one, Mark Kerr. Well, undoubtedly at this point, if you've been watching our channel long enough, you'll know the story of Mark Kerr. Number one, Mark Kerr. Number two, Mark Kerr. Three, nothing wrong with me. Right, I don't want to repeat myself and give you all a bunch of information you already know, so let's just look at his career for what it was. Not only was Mark physically perhaps the most biggest and intimidating looking fighter ever, he also had actual grappling credentials to back up. <laughs> Nobody wins the most prestigious grappling tournament in the world, ADCC, three times because they got lucky. Now translate that into MMA. Now you've got this guy who could arguably play the Hulk on TV, able to secure takedowns, batter people with ground and pound, and submit you. He's the first wrestler who wants to learn something. He's the first smart one, and that's why he's so good. Yeah, he was the scariest man on the planet. World Valley Tudo 3 tournament winner, UFC 14 tournament winner, and UFC 15 tournament winner. Then Pride picked him up, and he won five more fights in a row. The Pride tournament directors even started changing the rules because of Mark. You know, they took all the weapons of Mark out. You know, there's no kneeing on the ground, there's no elbows. You know, that's, that's Mark's specialty. Go to the side, meet the guy in the head, elbow him, you know. Now suddenly they take that out. And well, most of us know what happened next. His long time battle with opioids and addiction to painkillers, troubles with his girlfriend, Dawn Staples, injuries, everything just compiled to slowly sap away at the smashing machine. After losing his rematch to Igor Vov Chanchin and then getting TKO'd for the first time in his career against Heath Herring, everything fell apart. Mark disappeared for three years and when he came back, the questions about his ability to still complete were immediately answered when he KO'd himself in just 40 seconds at Pride 27. His aura of invincibility as well as his heroic physique had all but faded. He continued to compete for another five years where he lost seven more fights where he was finished in every single one of them. The before and after images of him from his early days to his final fights paints the picture of a career and a man filled with struggles both mentally and physically. But for a time, there wasn't a scarier man in mixed martial arts. All right, how about a big thank you for the most intimidating guy in the office, Luke Taylor. Just look at him, terrifying, isn't he? You can give him a thank you and show some appreciation by following him on Twitter at call to me underscore. I'm intimidated by the size of Ben Rosette's guitar and his ability to write the intro song. Thank you, Ben, as always, for making that music for us. You can check out more of his stuff on Spotify at Ben Rosette. And a big thank you to our Hall of Fame channel members. Thanks for supporting the channel. I hope you enjoyed that super secret preview of that super secret thing we're working on. Ooh. Comment down below who you think is the scariest fighter of all time and who became easy prey pretty simple stuff thanks for watching give us a like if you enjoyed it hit the subscribe button to see more i have been balian and i will see you in the next one yeah